On the 19th of May 2015, CD Projekt Red's The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt launched, setting the bar for the standard of quality in role-playing games. Here we are, five years on, and I cannot say that there's been an RPG to trumpet since. In my eyes, this game is the champion of the genre. A masterfully told, story-driven, action-packed, immersive and magical yet somewhat bleak fantasy in which we're thrust into the shoes of an awesome professional monster slayer who sees the world for what it is. A truly excellent base to construct a powerful narrative, one of the many factors that contribute to why I believe The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is one of the best games that I have ever played. Maybe you share the same opinion, maybe you're willing to be convinced. Either way, enjoy this video on why I believe The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is is the RPG's unbeaten benchmark. Okay, this video is likely to be a tin of worms. This is no small game, and so I'd expect this content to be no small task. This game is worth every second you see on the timer, so I'd 100% recommend sitting it out. Maybe I'm saying that because I mean it, or maybe it's because I want ad revenue. Who cares? I digress, there's no such thing as a perfect game, and so by extension there's likely to be no such thing as a perfect RPG. Just like with all other video games and media beyond, The Witcher 3 is art. Perfect is not a word you should associate with art, as there's always room to improve. And so I will not sit here and pretend the game's perfect, because perfect is a myth. And if you're going to drop to the comments and cry about how The Witcher 3 is overrated, just stop. In the simplest way, for a game to be overrated, it needs to have a reputation beyond its merits. Say what you will about the game, but there's no denying the game's merits have warranted a hard-earned great reputation. The main bulk of this video will be addressing those merits, so please hold on to your hats. Before we get started though, for the uninitiated I do feel like we need to address what an RPG is. I don't mean to insult your intelligence, so I'll keep it as brief as I possibly can. An RPG is a role-playing game. Thanks to the countless hybrid subgenres going absolutely nuts, it's relatively difficult to define what is or isn't an RPG, but it's typically defined by the ability to improve your character through perks and levelling up, a certain main quest in an open world surrounded by side quests you can choose to do or not to do, the ability to interact immersively with the world through additional mechanics and menu-based combat combat systems with changeable weapons and armour and active abilities, and they typically come with decision making features regarding character development and dialogue. So in short, if you want to see the poster boy of all RPGs, The Witcher 3 isn't far off. Role playing games are harder to define than I thought. <laughs> now I will address this, it's not necessarily fair to hold all RPGs to the same standard due to the vastness of the genre that I already mentioned before, but I feel like overall The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is the best RPG that I've played. That's why I'm making this video. Now I think it's time we get into talking about what what makes this masterfully crafted game so gobsmacking. Under most circumstances, talking about the world would be an awkward starting point, however in the case of The Witcher 3 I feel like it's the perfect place to begin. If you were to ask me what I think is the most important thing in nailing in an immersive experience, it's 100% the world that you find yourself in. If you don't succeed in nailing that, then you're failing in the role playing part of the role playing game. Which is a shame because a lot of games that I have played have dull open world areas with nothing to see or do really outside of box ticking exercises and fetch quests, and sometimes every region in these games looks and feels the same as well. The Witcher 3 does not lack on the open world front. Immersion is at the forefront with this game. Every area feels somewhat different. You know when you're in the bloodstained no man's land that comprises Velen, the atmospheric city of Novigrad, or the Isles of Skellige, or even the glorious valley of Kaer Morhen? What's more is the unique atmosphere is defined by the NPCs having different accents in different areas, different beliefs and ways of life. The regions also have different weather, different lighting, as well as their own soundtracks. All these factors contributing to making a different general atmosphere overall. I feel like if you want me to elaborate further, I think I'd be better off just showing you examples of how the different regions feel different. So that's exactly what we're going to do.
the thinking customer will see right away I've got the best deals this side of the pond. And tracks the sacred flame especially. my young'uns to pick mushrooms yesterday. To the woods? Alone? You know how it is. I've too many mouths. Yeah, I have sucks on the old tree. No, watch it, you like clowns. His eyes red, like embers. Even where areas within these regions may look similar, there's always some defining side quest that helps you distinguish between one area and the next. The world feels alive because it's not some blocky, stale, flat region with repetitive fetch quests and vacant NPCs standing around doing absolutely nothing. What on earth is Geralt doing with his arm? Okay, this is magical. The NPCs interact with the world in a simple way, really, but even still, it really does add flavour. While traversing the open world, you will notice how something is always happening somewhere. The Witcher 3 makes sure that you don't go too long without seeing something which helps tether you to the living, breathing feeling that the game is trying to produce. You don't just go from objective to objective doing nothing, everything feels like it has a purpose. Whether you run into a side quest, a few bits of dialogue, or a simple camp of bandits, or even if you just get jumped in the streets of Novigrad. Even when it is simple, the game doesn't throw mundane objectives at you, it allows you to see what's there for yourself. Sometimes it's rewarding, sometimes it's not. Maybe it helps you level up a little quicker, maybe you find some good gear or useful diagrams to craft good gear. Maybe you'll run into what appears to be the beginning of a side quest, but instead you just get ambushed by bandits. What happened to your father? He was cutting wood, and a bear attacked him. Show me where it happened. Over here, past the trees. So even when it appears to just be a side quest, you never quite know what you're getting into. When in towns, The Witcher 3 puts none of the NPC AI to waste. The NPCs can be interacting with the world as people naturally would, talking to one another in conversations you can overhear, children can be seen playing, and at times they'll run up to you and ask you questions out of curiosity. NPCs make remarks about Geralt as he passes on a spectrum of beliefs. Some may be curious about witches, others may be afraid of them, and others may be simply indifferent. Some may outright call Geralt a freak or a mutant, whereas other people may be kinder. Above the heads of the NPCs you get the text of the dialogue that they're saying, which in a lot of games would feel like clutter on the screen, but The Witcher actually loopholes this quite well. Witches have superhuman senses, meaning that they have advanced hearing. This is how the game feeds you that information that Geralt picks up as he travels through the world. The game also uses this feature to draw attention to certain things that may be going on. 
which may lead into a little encounter of some sort, or they may even use this to draw attention to what might lead you into a quest. There's a lot of life in this open world, there's always something going on. It feels alive even if it isn't densely populated or brimming with quests and contracts to distract us in some areas. With varying degrees of depth, you never know how long you'll spend in one location no matter how big or small it may seem. On top of this, the quests are so diverse that you never know who you might run into or what you might wind up doing, which is one of the many ways in which this game helps tether you to the world. Other immersion features include taverns in which you can go in and stock up on food, drink or talk to the bartender or play Gwent with some random gent in the corner of the room. You can also have some interesting interactions while you're in there. Not a place I'd ever expect to find a scholar. Take it you're fleeing the war? Quite the opposite. Chasing it. I'm headed for the front. Tired of life? You can take Witcher contracts at local notice boards, or you could just read some absurdly funny benign letters that are on there as well. But you can use these notice boards to actually take Witcher contracts, which are never as simple as they may seem, adding that extra layer of depth to the world. The best part about an immersive world is you do not feel as if the world revolves around the protagonist. You feel like a part of the world. I could talk all day about how great the world of The Witcher 3 feels to experience. It's truly breathtaking. The high quality world presented in all of its aspects results in a wonderfully immersive experience, which is key to any good RPG. Five years on and the visuals of The Witcher 3 still holds up. Sure, the game isn't anywhere near being the newest of titles anymore, and the graphics aren't the most glorious on the market now, but the game still looks incredible. From stunning scenery to epic shots with incredible lighting, the graphics, though not important and not necessarily the best that you'll ever see getting about for modern standards, are still done to a quality that is vibrant and helps express the game. I will say sometimes the faces can look a little daft. I can't stop dreaming about the landmines. Now this isn't a common thing and even if it was, the graphics aren't particularly important so we're going to swiftly move on. Every narrative, no scratch that, every game needs a great score to captivate the drama, otherwise your experience is bland, flavourless, epic moments are rendered boring, everything feels slower paced, and as a result of that you're less immersed in what's going on. The Witcher 3 knows the importance of its soundtrack, and smashes it with an awesome score that plays while you play the game. Like many games, The Witcher 3 uses the soundtrack to distinguish where you are and what you're doing. If you're fighting, combat music plays. If the quest is sombre, more sombre music plays. If the quest is more upbeat, more upbeat music plays. Even when you're exploring, the music is different depending on what region you're in. I love The Witcher 3 soundtrack, I think that it's incredible. It really captures the story, the drama, the characters, and the world. Now a lot of games know the importance importance of a quality soundtrack, it's not something exclusive to The Witcher 3, but this game is one of the many examples of how glorious music is used to enhance the quality of video games. The main story of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is exceptional. In order to understand it fully, The Witcher 3 is the third part of the story of the games, with the rest being in The Witcher 1 and 2. These games take place after the books written by the Polish author Andrzej Sapkowski or however you pronounce that name. We play as a witcher named Geralt of Rivia and spend the best chunk of the game looking for Geralt's ward, Ciri, who is on the run from the menacing Wild Hunt, a group of sinister dressed elves that come from another world, to put it simply, who are after Ciri because she possesses the Elder Blood. But I shan't get too deep into it. We follow Geralt as he tracks down Ciri, going from Velen to the city of Novigrad and then to the Isles of Skellige and so on. As Geralt tries to figure out where she is, you feel his commitment to his mission, often finding ourselves engaging in wild goose chases as we go in in order to obtain information, such as the Bloody Baron storyline, or the search for Dandelion in Novigrad. Though these stories have their own self-contained plots as well, what makes them so great is that everything feels relevant, so even though you may be going from A to B to C to D to E and so on, it feels like you're making progress. And the quality of the self-contained story that runs parallel with the main story in these wild goose chase arcs is equally as high, which makes you care enough to see them through even after they lose relevance for the main story. And so I can say with confidence that The Witcher 3 has some of the best wild goose chases that I think I've ever played. <laughs> Parts of the story can even have their own mini outcomes depending on the choices you make as well, and the game makes it so that that matters. I'm going to use the Baron questline as an example again. There's a certain point in the quest where you run into a spirit that's trapped in a tree. You can choose to free it or kill it. If you kill it, the Baron's wife loses her mind. Bye! Bye for dinner! Moon pie! 
but if you free it, she turns into a water hag. Upon investigation, the curse that turned her into a water hag is tethered to a few dolls. You have to choose the right one, otherwise she will die. If you choose the wrong one, she bursts into flames and dies, and you'll later discover that after this the Baron hanged himself. If you choose the right one, she'll turn back to herself, but eventually she'll die anyway and the Baron hangs himself from that outcome too. But if you choose to kill the tree spirit, and as a result Anna lives, the Baron will live, pledging to care for his wife. I know a hermit. A very wise man with a gift for healing. Met him some time past. Lives in the Blue Mountains. I shall take her there. I will not touch drink. I will find the hermit. And once she is herself again, we will find you. So if you take time to weigh up the outcomes of your decisions, little details will change by the end. If you blast through the game and avoid too much side content, you may still get a good ending, but it may not wind up being a good ending for every character that you meet. The game uses this to integrate the side content into the main content because the side content is important. Not necessarily enough to drastically alter the ending of the game, but it might alter certain points of the story and it might alter the ending. For example, if you help absolutely everybody, when it comes to the battle at Kaer Morhen after finding Ciri, more characters will come and join you in that fight as you helped them when they needed you. And of course on top of that there are a couple of characters that you can find who you can send to Kaer Morhen after completing side quests with them. One of which being Letho of Gullet who you can actually kill in The Witcher 2. If you don't, you can choose to make him helpful here, and that is rather cool. But you get my point, side quests can impact the main story, which is what we're talking about. We'll talk more in depth about side quests shortly, however. Another thing I want to bring up about the main story is at certain points you can play as Ciri. This is done as a way to attach us to this character who otherwise we wouldn't see up until Geralt finds her. As a result, we care about the journey of both Geralt and Ciri. Beyond the protagonist and the deuteragonist, you have the unplayable side characters that you meet along this journey, and these characters are made memorable. From Dandelion's Tom Foolery to Zoltan's enormous personality, or Yennefer's sarcasm to Vesemir's wisdom, or Lambert's callousness to Eskel's face, I guess. The characters in the story and beyond are memorable because they're unique, fun and engaging. They involve us in this world and really consolidate this feeling that Geralt is only a part of this atmosphere. He's only a detail on the big picture and that is key for RPGs to get right in order to feel immersive. I'm going to be honest, when I finished this game I genuinely felt empty because the characters an excellent story made for an insanely great adventure and I was sad that it was over. Not many games make me genuinely feel like this, but The Witcher 3 does. Speaking of the ending, there are several out comes to the story depending on decisions you make subconsciously as you go through dialogue options and the like. Especially towards the end, your dialogue decisions matter. You don't get variations of the same ending with the illusion of choices making an impact, you get your choices that make an impact and as a result of those choices you may get a different ending entirely. And all of those endings are delivered to a high quality. All are satisfying depending on the decisions that you made. And are rewarding or not accordingly. Sure the main story takes time, at times requiring you to go and do other things to progress a little due to the levelling curve. But thanks to the compliment that is the open world of this game that you're met by, this feels more natural. I'll talk more about how The Witcher 3 nails the numerical levelling system later, but for me it never gets to a point where I realise I've come to a quest that's too high a level for me, due to being sidetracked so easily by side content which can distract you for hours on end, and before you realise it you're well enough leveled to continue. As I mentioned the main story is long. The game is aware of its length and the general tension of the main story and thus breaks it down with tonally consistent well timed humour that I never fail to chuckle at. Okay, this is a rather serious looking chap, he must be really into his art. Okay, the artist has agreed to help us with a very sit- Oh my god, what the fuck is that? These little jokes are subtle and don't self-destruct the gravitas in the process of being told. Altogether, the main story for The Witcher 3 is outstanding. Great characters, great atmosphere, great soundtrack, the objectives never feel like filler, and ultimately when it comes to talking about the narrative for The Witcher 3, the only thing that I can really say is, what more could you possibly want? The Witcher 3 approaches its side content with the same level of care and integrity shown in its main story. The quality is unwavering. I believe it's one of the most authentic integrations of side content that I've seen in any game ever. Sure at face value it's nothing special, but allow me to explain why it is. When I'm playing the side content for The Witcher 3, at times I can't even tell if what I'm playing is side content or main content, obviously it defines that quite clearly in the menus, but if you didn't check that, a lot of the time you wouldn't know. As a result you're left with this sense that Geralt would have 
done all these things, as the story naturally provides us lots of opportunities to go and do them. And as a result of the quality of the side content as well, it doesn't matter whether you're doing main content or side content because it feels like all of it matters. But perhaps most importantly when it comes to The Witcher 3 side content, the best part about them is that they're memorable. If I were to sit here and list all the memorable side quests in The Witcher 3, I'd have grey hair by the time it's done. So instead I'll simply list a few. I remember helping Triss escape Novigrad, assisting Dijkstra in a plot to kill old Radovid, hunting down a depraved serial killer on the streets of Novigrad, discovering a shipwreck atop a mountain for some disorienting gin related reason, and of course, who could ever forget shoving a baby in an oven which I did with a worrying lack of hesitation. This is why I'll never be vegan. And if those examples don't sell it, who doesn't love exchanging riddles with trolls? I'm light as a feather, but even a troll can't hold me for long. These fucking trolls are stupid, man. Side quests even play into the ending of the game in certain ways that alter minor details that are cool to notice in passing. Choosing to engage the world matters, and you never have to go out of your way to do so because the game masterfully blurs the line between what counts as the main quest and what's but a simple side quest. As I've mentioned, it tells you what's what in the menus, but it allows main quests to naturally lead into side quests and it allows those side quests to naturally have an effect on the main quest. Sure, the smooth natural flow doesn't apply to all the side content, as often you'll have crucial news to tell someone or act on, and the first dialogue option you see is, wanna play Gwent? Hello Mr. Baron, yes it's me, the Witcher, back with some crucial information about your demented wife serving a trio of disgusting witch things in the woods. But that can wait, let's play fucking Gwent. Yeah mate, my wife can wait, let's play some Gwent. I honestly do want to believe that playing Gwent in that moment was more canonically important than finding the Baron's wife. To be fair, Gwent is the one activity in this game that I never could get into and ignored at every single opportunity. Not much happening just yet, and there may be some time before it does. Well. How about a game of Gwent? How about no? Sure, if you like Gwent, that's cool. I'm just here to kill monsters, not play fucking Yu-Gi-Oh. Doesn't mean I dislike it being in the game. Many games are great fun, they just don't tend to always be for everyone. I do suppose Gwent is just one such example of a mini game that I appreciate existing, but I'll never touch it. Outside of the quests, sort of, but also sort of not, you have Witcher contracts. Technically side quests, but they're slightly different. You find these on notice boards, mixed with all kinds of nonsense. But Witcher contracts are there so that you can do things that Witchers would naturally do. You take the contract, you talk to the person who put it up, and though this is the game's equivalent to any kind of error in quest that you might find in any other game, they all have this story, some take on a more mysterious tone, where you have to figure out what exactly is going on and then how best to tackle it from there. When you discover the nature of the beast that you're tracking, you can open your bestiary to find out how exactly you can defeat it, and then you can confront the beast and do it in. Though as is the case with a lot of monsters, they can be extremely dangerous. So you have to think tactically. Then you can take a trophy from their bodies if you wish, and then you can return to the contact to get your pay. And though when it comes to certain situations, there's sometimes an option to refuse the pay. Keep the coin. You took in an orphan. Need it more than I do. And they call witches unfeeling. Inhuman. Well, I thank ye. From the bottom of my heart. Though this feature is mainly there to allow you to be a witcher, you'll always find that every contract has its own story or maybe even a unique twist. For example, you may take a contract from a man whose wife is missing. You ask around the town and find out that she went into the woods. While searching for her in the woods, you may be attacked by a pack of wolves, after which the man's wife's sister shows up and asks you to stop investigating and just tell the man that his wife's dead. She offers to double the pay here, you can accept her offer or refuse. Naturally, there's something fishy afoot here, so we just keep investigating until we find the man wife who has been absolutely ripped to shreds. A trail from the horrific scene leads us to a cabin, under which there is a cave. Once in the cave, we wait until night time and there we get attacked by a werewolf. Upon defeating the wolf, this suspicious woman shows up again and tells us that the werewolf is actually the man who gave us the contract. Turns out she wanted her sister's husband for herself, and so tried to get her sister to see what this man truly was. However, this backfired and the werewolf killed his own wife. After this point, the werewolf vows to kill his wife's sister. We can choose to step in and intervene or not. If we don't, this happens. You have no mercy for your sister. I'll have none for you. Ah! 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 
Upon leaving, the werewolf will follow you out, asking you to kill him. And so that's what Geralt does. On the body, we find a key to a stash, and that's how we collect our reward. What I really like about Witcher Contracts is it shows that even the simplest form of quests is required to have some form of depth. In one Witcher Contract, you could be battling a monster. In another, you could be lifting a curse. Sometimes the Witcher Contracts raise the moral question, who's the real monster here? And not every contract winds up ending in violence. Another cool feature about Witcher contracts is you can negotiate pay. If the base rate isn't enough, you can always push for a little more, but you've got to be careful because if you ask for too much, it slowly raises the annoyance level of the contract giver. You've got to barter for an acceptable price. If you annoy them too much, you simply will have to just accept the base rate. After all, they won't turn you away because in the end of the day, there's still a monster that needs dealing with. These contracts tend to rely on the Witcher Senses gameplay feature quite heavily. Beyond Witcher contracts, you have races and fist fights. I didn't really get too much into the races, however the fist fights are always fun, I do love punching people. And if all that doesn't take your fancy, there's always looking for better gear, which you can find through Witcher gear, which you need to find diagrams for and then you need to craft most of the time. I think in my entire 200 plus hours of playing this game, and believe me I'm well aware that that's amateur hours, I only ever found a lootable piece of Witcher gear in a chest pre-made once. But it's not too tough to get your hands on all the diagrams and then craft. Moving on while traversing this open world, if your objective is far away, then you can be certain that along the way you'll be distracted by something. Unless you're travelling really far by boat, and even though you might get attacked by harpies on the way, that can genuinely be mind-numbing. Oh shit, a giant whale, that's fucking awesome! Sometimes while travelling you'll be met by glorious views, bandit attacks, ambushes, witcher contracts as you go, or maybe even quests. Sometimes you'll automatically enter a cutscene when you wind up in a new place. Other times you may just be left to keep going if that's what you want to do. Naturally when I get asked to travel long distances in open world games I roll my eyes. But in The Witcher 3 it feels like an opportunity to soak in more of this world. Ultimately the side content in The Witcher 3 is plentiful and fills this vast open world to an extent that provides considerable depth which is pivotal to the greatness of any role playing game. No matter how good the story's concept is, how much side content there is, or to what degree of quality you aim for, the glue that makes every last piece of this work is the protagonist, the vessel in which you use to experience this game, this world. In The Witcher 3 we have Geralt of Rivia, a character who tries to give the illusion of being a simple, lowly Witcher, when in reality, he's a much more complex character. Witches are said to have no emotion, but Geralt time and time again proves this in-game stereotype wrong. His role in life is slaying monsters for humans, as is the profession of a witcher. Though Geralt calls into question on many occasions, who are the real monsters? Geralt himself presents a loose definition of what it is to be a monster, which allows us to interfere where we would naturally in an RPG, albeit keeping Geralt's core fundamental character just the same. When we make decisions as Geralt in quests, everything fits his character. You don't make wildly inconsistent choices based on what mood you're in, no matter what decision you make, it's always consistent and that's something I really like about playing as Geralt. We see the world from Geralt's perspective. The world is presented in a fashion according to that, so when it comes to making decisions it always makes sense. Furthermore, Geralt has relationships with other characters too. You can choose to romance either Yennefer or Triss. Beyond that, Geralt has friendships with other characters such as Zoltan and Dandelion. Then there's his brotherly-like relationship with the other witches Lambert and Eskel. You get to see all three of them drunk and it's really funny. Hello, youngins. Got your own little carnival going, eh? Alcohol, my good men, is a witcher's worst enemy. Where did you dig up that bonnet? Vesemir's trunk. The height of fashion in 1112. Old man probably put it on when he went courting. Or in the jargon of the time, wooing the damsels. Men, a witcher's life is not all cards and liquor. It is toil. It is labor. No gurgling babes to wean for us. Oh, Amber, bud, gotta tell you something. Yeah? Sometimes you're a real jackass, but I love you, brother. And sometimes you're a real blowhard. But damn it, I go to hell and back for you. Come here, yo. Damn, broke. 
Escol, chop, chop. Escol! Escol! Hey, look. There he is. And of course he has a paternal relationship with Ciri, whom he cares for like a father. Beyond this, Geralt has familiarity with a lot of other pre-established characters as well. That familiarity and vice versa really establishes Geralt's existence as a part of this world, as opposed to just a vessel you use to explore it. The game allows you enough agency to feel like you are Geralt. When handling situations, it presents predicaments from his perspective and presents options for what you can do in both gameplay and dialogue. All of which suit his character, but beyond that, Geralt of Rivia is his own Witcher. He's consistent and he's a character, which is most important. But you're also allowed the freedom to choose what Geralt does in certain situations from a spectrum of possible outcomes and options in keeping with his fundamentals. On top of this, Geralt is an incredibly well-voiced character. His sense of humour and wit is best described as dry and sarcastic, and as a result he does make some incredibly well-timed jokes. Buck Thorn, I do not know this, but I am not yet fluent in the common tongue. Mm -hmm. Probably mastered the basics though. Hands up. Kill them. What? Who dares disturb my divine being? Huh. <laughs> Expected they all got to be corporeal in form, but never thought he'd be... corpulent. Fattened up nicely at those peasants' expense. Beware of wild strawberries. Raspberries too. Yeah, treacherous as beasts go. I always keep an eye out for him. Altogether, Geralt of Rivia is a great character. As you can imagine, for a character who's not particularly excitable due to Witcher mutations, creating the depth that CD Projekt Red have created here is incredibly difficult. This game does it masterfully. Without fun gameplay, a video game may as well be a movie or a TV show. The Witcher 3's gameplay is smooth, free and fluid. I wouldn't go as far as to say I can't fault it because Geralt dies from ridiculously low falls and Roach is always finding another awkward place to show up. She's a pesta, and now she's free. Alright, time to leave. Why is my horse a part of the wall? However, to be fair, I have no real issues with the gameplay. For the most part, it's great. Sure, in cluttered areas, horse riding is a bit tedious, and the gameplay can feel a little bit slidey at times, if that makes sense. But let's talk about the great parts of the gameplay. For example, the combat. Obviously, you can choose the difficulty of combat going into the game, from piss easy to really, really difficult, to account for all kinds of players, those who want challenge and those who want an easier experience, as well as the middle camp who like a balanced experience. The combat system is relatively thoughtful. You have to combine heavy and light attacks, parries, dodges and rolls as well as witcher signs to get the most out of it. Art is best used to break shields and defences and stagger enemies. Quen is good for creating a shield so you can land attacks on more aggressive enemy types more liberally. Igni burns shit and we love it and I'm not sure what else there is to say. Irden is good for when fighting certain enemy types. You can use it to create a circle inside of which if you hit an enemy you do massive amounts of damage. It's really useful against wraiths and things. And actually can be used to daze enemies in combat which renders them defenceless which gives you time to deal massive amounts of damage to them. All of that is not taking into account what you can do with extra perks on the signs and things. The signs effects and the extent of their power depends on the perks used, which you obtain from skill points which you get from levelling up and meditating at places of power. The same goes for other combat abilities, my favourite of which being Flurry, which just causes a madness when you get it right. Beyond signs, you have potions and food that you can consume in combat if you need to regenerate health. Or as it's known in this game, VITALITY. Oh yes, I feel proper sophisticated saying that word. Obviously, if you're a more patient player, you're likely to gather all the ingredients required to brew Witcher potions. But say you don't have the patience to gather all these Witcher potions, or you just run out. All is not lost for you have the backup of 53 potatoes. Who needs fucking swallowing? you've got a pocket full of taters. As ridiculous as it may seem, you can use consumables to replenish vitality or reduce the overall damage that you receive, among all other kinds of benefits at any point, if you ever feel that you need to, and more often than not, it proves to be a lifesaver. Obviously you have two swords, a silver sword for monsters and a steel sword for mundane enemies such as humans, wolves or bears, which look nothing like bears, what the fuck? If you use a steel sword against a monster, it's ineffective and you'll auto-equip the silver sword, and vice versa. You automatically draw the relevant weapon most of the time, 
but you can use left and right on the D-pad for example to switch. You also have a crossbow which unless you're fighting harpies or you're on a boat or you're underwater is completely useless so you might as well forget about it. If you encounter enemies on horseback and linger too long the horse's fear level will rise and as a result if it gets too high your horse will buck you off and then proceed to bolt off into the distance. If you want to pass the time you can meditate which also replenishes vitality. Dialogue options technically count here as well though we've already touched down on those in quite a bit of detail. You get various responses depending on a spectrum of potential possible outcomes and responses that are in keeping with Geralt's character. The direction of the game hinges on your decisions here often a quest can go one way if you choose one option but choose the other and it's all different and that may factor into more later on or it may not. Even the main story's ending depends primarily on decisions that you make in dialogue towards the end of the game. Onto the customization front weapons and gear can be found throughout the world you can apply runes to them upgrade them enhance them and repair them when they get damaged. You can craft gear with the right resources and recipes which I honestly recommend as that's the best way to get gear in this game that's actually good and also does not look ridiculous as you may find some decent gear otherwise but you'll just also look silly. The customization does suffer from the pitfall of the best gear you'll find doesn't always look that great but you have enough options for it to not matter and you can craft some kick-ass looking gear anyway so this is a non-problem. As far as beard and hair customization goes, your beard grows over time, however you can shave it at a barbershop alongside the option to change your hairstyle to a few presets, one of which I've seen genocides prettier than. Who allowed this to happen? Before we move on from this big gameplay segment, I want to talk a little bit about the leveling system. The Witcher 3's leveling system is quite fascinating because in a lot of RPGs of this sort with a numerical leveling system, every time you level up, you need more and more experience points to get to the next level. In The Witcher 3, the experience points required to level up once you hit level 20 roughly speaking is always set to 2000. This increased gap peaks early to avoid imbalancing the game. Lower level contracts slowly decrease in the experience that they yield so in order to level up you need to tackle tasks that are to your level but leveling up isn't a ridiculously long grind. This makes the game more authentic. Its length is not in the steep leveling curve. It's purely based on the game's merits. This is a long high quality game and the developers knew that going in. They don't need to install a grind fest to pretend to be a lengthy RPG because in the end of the day it has no shallowness to hide it is a lengthy RPG with depth and quality in abundance. Beyond all this you have the gameplay feature of Witcher Senses which allows you to find pieces of evidence relevant to what's going on. It highlights containers containing loot and you can use it to pick up relevant scents as well as hear enemies that are nearby that you just can't see yet. It's incredibly useful in tracking down people and monsters alike and plays a huge role in many main quests, side quests and Witcher contracts. Overall when it comes to the gameplay I'm not going to sit here and say that it's especially groundbreaking but I think its smoothness and functionality is magnificently pulled off and as a result it only enhances the experience. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt originally released five years ago, and for me the game still goes strong. The Witcher 3 has never grown stale on me, the same I cannot say for a lot of other games in the genre. Many games have tried to replicate what The Witcher 3 has done. Some of the games have managed to a degree, rarely you'll find one that's really good, and of course you have your odd really bad game as well. But I love none quite like how I love The Witcher 3. I believe this game truly captures what it means to be an RPG. It has a great narrative, an excellent world, an excellent cast of lovable characters, and hateable where applicable. Gorgeous scenery, a stellar soundtrack, deep gameplay with ample thoughtful elements, and no matter how much I say, I would never do this game justice because it's just that incredible. Though there are a lot of other incredible RPGs out there in the genre, no RPG can quite compare. And so with that said, even after 5 years on the throne, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt remains the RPG's unbeaten benchmark. Hey everyone, thank you for watching that video. I hope you enjoyed as much as I enjoyed making it. It did take a long time to get done. I had to record the entirety of the game. I played on New Game Plus, so I was okay. What the hell is my hair doing? Jesus. If you did enjoy the video, I would really appreciate it if you could give this video a like. If you're new, maybe consider hitting subscribe. And if you want to support this content, maybe head over to the Patreon and get all the extra content over there. Whether or not you think it's worth it is completely up to you. For as little as $1 a month though, you can get some extra stuff, including early access to videos like this. Don't feel forced to do anything like that, and if you don't want to do that, or if you can't do that, and you still want to show support for this video, please share it with all your pals. And if you don't have any friends, then... Same. 
Of course, at some point, I do plan to do videos based on the DLCs for The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, but that's not today. But until my next video, thank you all for watching, and I will see you all very soon. Goodbye.